So I'm gonna slowly start. So welcome to this second workshop, Talut. I'm starting to upload some of the videos on the Trice Robotics YouTube. So the very first video is right here. It includes not only the content that I talk about in the slides, but also any questions that anyone asks. And of course, if you're interested, uh, you know, if you're interested in optimizing your settings, this basically goes through some of the document properties in SolidWorks to make uh, SolidWorks a little bit faster. And some stuff to look for. I think the most important thing when it comes to SolidWorks and the, and the tutorials that I'm going to teach is that my goal is basically to tell you about all the different tools that you can use. Something that eventually that you end up learning is how exactly you should utilize these tools because you know, you could learn how to do X, Y, and Z, but you know that after a while, you might get stuck in tutorial hell where you just basically just keep on doing tutorials. But I think doing your own personal project, doing something for a club, doing something for a specific reason is where a lot of the learning takes place. And a lot of these things that I'm gonna teach you are just the tools and what you should be aware of. I, what I really like about the second option called the case study, is that some of these can be super long, but what's really fantastic is that you basically follow someone, design something. So this random one from the intermediate case study is right here. So you can see this guy is basically designing a wind turbine. I think it's, I think especially if you have experience with SOLIDWORKS, I recommend looking at some of these because there is a large difference in learning what the tools do compared to actually using the tools yourself and kind of messing around with them. Like you can kind of see right here, uh, someone is making sort of a wheel, kind of like the center hub, uh, the MW for like a tire. And I think it's, I think a lot of it comes from practice. So I highly recommend that, you know, you look at these case studies, if you have, you have time, you want interested in SOLIDWORKS. And if not, then hopefully you have some personal projects that you can do to sort of practice these things that you will learn. So let's go into the slide section. So this is the main slide. Welcome to the second workshop. These are the topics that we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about very briefly about the part process overview. Then we'll go straight into SOLIDWORKS. There's not a lot of slides for this section because a lot of stuff that I'll show you, planes, tools, relations, are basically gonna be in SOLIDWORKS. Like always, if you're not sure what to do during this workshop, this one is gonna be mainly in SOLIDWORKS. And I know for the next two, our next year, the next couple workshops is also be mainly in SOLIDWORKS. Feel free to just watch along, or if you want, you can try your best at looking how, you can try your best, try to follow along in SOLIDWORKS. This works best if you have a split screen or a dual monitor, but if you have to end up using art time, I might recommend that you either watch the recording and pause, or you can just follow along just watching the video. So, so I recommended prerequisites. Uh, hopefully, like, hopefully you should have SOLIDWORKS by now. Uh, if you're a mechanical recruit, then you should have access to the common parts library. If you are not a mechanical member, then in the public folder, you have all the parts you need in order for the assignments. The common parts library is basically very similar to the toolbox that I showed you earlier in the last workshop, where basically you can make gears, nuts and stuff. It's just all the, all the parts that we use that team use something like square tubing. We don't have to search online to look for that type of stuff. It's just right there. And most importantly, even if you are not just a mechanical member, we have the rules. This specific link right here is just directly to our shared drive, but we do have the building specifications for each robot, which basically talk about, you know, volume constraints, design constraints, it has electronic, electronic, you know, restraints. Like it'd be like, oh, like, you can't consume this much wattage of power. You know, this particular piece of electronic, you can, like there's a certain voltage threshold that you must, you know, stay within or else it might explode. It might let out its magic smoke. So building specifications and rules are super nice. So the part process. So in SOLIDWORKS, when you're building parts, the most common thing that you end up doing is starting with sketches. And that's what we'll go over in this tutorial. You might start off with a rectangle or circle. And using these sketches, you're able to use something called sketch features and applied features. We'll go over those stuff in tomorrow's workshop. But basically, a very brief overview is you can start with the rectangle. And what you can do is use something called an extruded boss. 
and I'll, sh I'll sh quickly show you that during this workshop. I'll cover it more in depth during the next workshop. Basically, can I start with the 2D plane and sketch features? The Cheetah Boss basically allows you to pull it into 3D. Apply feature, there is a fillet that you can see on your right. It basically rounds the corner. You don't really, so for most applied features, you don't necessarily need a sketch. Uh, you all you need is the body, but for some of them, a sketch can be really helpful in helping guide. So the next thing is going straight to SolidWorks. So let me open up SolidWorks super quick. I'm gonna start. It might it might take a while. If SolidWorks loads too slow for you, then what might be happening is that you have a lot of add-ons that are needed at the startup page. So you can go into options, add-ons, and turn some of them off because that does slow down stuff a little bit. Let me stop sharing so quick and go into SolidWorks. So usually at this point, I would usually go into advanced and use some of my templates like this right one for parts, but I'm gonna just use normal parts for people who are following along so you can see exactly what I'm seeing. A little, little bit. I'm going to close this thing on to my right side. I don't need to use it that much. I'm going to quickly change things to millimeters because we use millimeters a lot in this club. The first thing I always like to do is save. So it doesn't really matter what you name it because this is going to be a practice piece. They usually start with part one. You want to have a descriptive name. So you can kind of see in some of these folders uh, right here, you know, chassis base plate. You, you want to make it kind of specific, but since this just a basic thing, let's just have it be a very default name, part one, save as the SOLIDWORKS part. There we go, part one. So the very so the very first thing that it's very useful is something that's on the left side. So this is something called the feature manager. So it says right here, the feature manager design tree. It basically gives you all the stuff that you would need in order to do with the sketches. You might not have some of these files that you see right here. I kind of changed it to stuff that I'd use a lot more often. But even if you cannot find these, then you can go into the search, like equations, you'd be able to find equations right here. Open this up it's just a little bit quicker. I can just right click it, manage equations. You also be able to customize. On the next thing, it's called the property manager. Uh, we don't use it that much. And then I never really found a need to use it, but you can click it and it kind of shows you a very decent overview of the types of properties you work on. Configuration manager. We'll cover configurations during tomorrow's lesson because that's more about part design. And I'll tell you reasons why I don't want to use different configurations. You have this tool called the Dimension Expert Manager. I don't really need it. I don't really use it. And then finally, we have appearances that you can also use from here. We'll use this tab when we talk about rendering. We'll be able to set appearances, any decals we want, and we'll be able to set the scene light in any cameras. So let's start with making a part. So when you, when you start with a part, the first thing that you start with is deciding a plane. So most of the time, the plane doesn't really matter about which plane you start with, but where it kind of does matter is you have a part that you're interested in and that you want it to look a certain way. So I'll sort of give you an example. So I usually start in the top plane. So let's use a circle super quick to demonstrate. I'll go with the sketch tools later. Don't really need any dimensions, exit out. Go with the features, extrude it, drag it up a little bit so we can have a cylinder. So you can kind of so you can see the cylinder. We have it on the top plate, and a lot of and if you when you make your parts, you want it to look like how it would be assembled. So for this cylinder, I think this is a pretty decent orientation. So let me switch to something I use more often. So in the club, we use square tubing for our robots because it is super lightweight, because it's hollow. So let me do something like this. And it also is pretty cheap. We can get it super cheap at certain places. So I have my square tube being looking up just like this. And, and normally for all intents and purposes, this is perfectly fine. And this probably is just enough for like a really weird piece, a really thick piece of square tubing. But in our club, we use really long pieces, and if we were to make this super long, it's, it's a lot more natural for myself 
it, it, this, all, this is all basically personal preference to have it kind of like long side because we use it for the base of our chassis. So we naturally have it laid out on, we don't, we don't have it sticking upwards. We have it more so sticking kind of like this way. So for that reason, you, you'd be interested in having it in, start in a different plane. So if you want to start in a different plane, you can go to your sketch, edit sketch plane. You're able, instead of using top, how about I'm interested in front? And see how it kind of changes. It's the exact same thing, but for me, it looks a little bit more natural. And if I were to put this onto a robot, I think that it would look something more like this. Maybe I'd have another one on this side and one on this side, one on this side to make a nice square. Same thing, we can also go the right side, just like this. But most of the time, I like having it on the top plane for if it's very general stuff because it shoots out from the top. It's really nice. Okay, let me delete this super quick. So what are some other stuff you can do with sketches? So there's something called suppress. It basically grays it out. It basically means that we're going to ignore this, pretend that this doesn't really exist. You can hide it, no longer there. You can show it back up. You get something called rollback. And what's super nice about the rollback feature is that it kind of goes back in time. We'll use this feature in the tomorrow's lesson when we talk about parts and I'll also talk about how to deal with some errors. But for now, we'll just have it be normal. So we'll go into sketches and then we'll start, we'll start talking about some of the sketch tools that you'll be using. So I'm going to press delete to delete all this. So let's start over here. There's dimensioning tools, which most of the time, smart dimension works 99% of the time. I'll talk to you about some certain cases. I know for, I use ordinate dimension. Sometimes I find it be kind of useful. So when we get to that point, I'll show you exactly how I use it. But smart dimension works 99% of the time. So let's start with the line tour. So we have our normal line tour that basically goes from left to right, very basic. It's the most common tool that you'd probably need. You wanna create a triangle, you're able to create a triangle with the line tool. I also use something called the center line tool. It's really nice when you want to be, we, we wanna use it as sort of like a guide. So the difference between solid lines and dashed lines that you can see here is that these dashed lines don't really mean anything, they're just to help you. So the most common example is if I were to create a rectangle with lines, you can see that it's sort of shaded. And it means that if I were to actually like create a cube, that it actually let me create a cube because it knows that this is the rectangle that's with this is where it's bounded by. But if I were to turn one of them into the sort of center line, and you can see the moment I basically turn into a construction line, it no longer has that shaded element. And when I try to go back, I basically have an error. So it cannot rebuild using the sketch. It has, it has a problem. It says the sketch contains an open contour. So that's basically the problem. So that's the reason why I use it. I use it a lot when I try to mirror stuff. And something that you can also use is something called the midpoint line. It's very useful because it allows you basically to guarantee symmetry. That no matter where I go, the left side is as long as the right side. And this little thing right here is called the origin. The origin is super nice. And usually symmetry is a fantastic thing. So if you can, I recommend trying to make things symmetrical. Next thing we'll go over is something called the circle tour. I mainly use just a very circle, very first option. It allows you to select the center and select the radius. The second option is the perimeter circle. It's kind of weird. I only use that option, but what you can do is select, as you can see based off this image, you select a point another point, and you can kind of decide the other point as well. I don't use it that much. I'm going to go down here. Rectangle. I use the corner and the center rectangle a lot more. The corner rectangle, as you can probably guess, you select one corner, you select the other corner. What's super nice about some of these tools is that instead of clicking, click, and then trying to dimension stuff, what you can do instead is click. And see on the left, I'm able to type in five, Fine. 
automatically does it for me. Sensor rectangle is super nice because it guarantees the symmetry that no matter what, that the left side is that the left side is going to be as far as away from the origin as the right side, and same thing with the top and the bottom. You have some other options that give you more precision based on if you want to rotate stuff. I don't really find much use for it, so I don't really use that option. You have something called the arcs. I use arcs kind of often. I'll give you some examples right here. Imagine I have two lines right here and I want to arc. I can use something called a tangent arc, which basically allows me to create a tangent path based off these lines. Something I also use pretty often, something called the center port arc. It basically allows me to, I use it more often to create kind of like a half circle or sort of like a circle that basically I don't fully need. You're able to create like part of a circle. I use it for that reason. I don't really use it for normal arc purposes. If I want to create like a little bit of a circle, like 45 of an arc, I can have that exactly how I want it. And then you also have the three-point arc. It's basically the same thing as the tangent arc, but you have a bit more power, as you can probably see. Socks are used very often. Is mainly we use it for manufacturing purposes. So basically, if we try to get two holes, two circles, oh, this is a very weird one. Let me go back to the normal one. If we try to get two circles, sometimes it can be very difficult to manufacture it to be precise. So what you'd kind of do instead sometimes is circle and then use a slot. We also use this for prototyping purposes. For example, what we're trying to do right now is trying to find the optimal distance for our flywheels in order to shoot the balls. So if you were to try to test out the different distances, having two holes might be very constraining if you're trying to just prototype, try to quickly test. But if you have a slot, you can kind of change the difference, change the distance super easily. So slots are very useful for prototyping purposes. We had the straight slot. Uh, straight slot. Basically, choose your line that you want. You can choose the radii or the distance. You have the center point, which is the symmetric version of it. Same thing. You have other options that basically, as you, as you can see, based off the image, it lets you curve it a little bit more. I never really had to use these. I would only really use this, the straight slot versions. You have polygons, if you need polygons, but a lot of the times lines are sufficient enough for me, so I use polygons. These lines are very useful if you want to uh, sketch an image. So sometimes you could bring images into SolidWorks and you can use the spline tool because it gives you a lot of control. See how I can kind of mess around with the tool, make whatever shape I want it to be. I don't really have to think about like, you know, straight lines or anything. You have ellipses, which are there. I never really have to use ellipses. You can use text tools. Sometimes I add in text tools. I could type in Triton Robotics, and it basically, Triton Robotics, and it basically makes that text for me. I use it a lot when I want to add on names into the robot. For example, when if I were to do a 3D printed part, or if I were to make something onto a plate and I were to laser cut a water jet, we'd have our name right there. And you can do a point. A point can be kind of useful, but I don't really use it that often because usually stuff comes with points already, like point, point for lines. Most of the time, I don't want to use it. And we do, we do have fillets that you can do. So I just found that you can also do a chamfer. So you can do a chamfer on the sketch level. So you can do a fillet on this side. Let's make it five. And you can also do a chamfer, which I just found out. So you can also do the ch uh, chamfer. You can do distance chamfer, or you can do an angle chamfer, which I did not know about. So we have, those are the very basic sketch tools that you can use. The ones over here all uh, require you something for it to be sketched already. And I'll quickly go with that. So imagine you kind of create a rectangle with just lines, very poor example, but you kind of overextend a little bit or you're trying to copy something, you know, a little bit off the edge. You could use the trim tool and it basically allows you to trim it away, which is super nice. We also, I use the trim kind of often because sometimes I overextend on things and I use the trim tools 
to kind of erase stuff. So imagine if we have that exact same extension and we want to do something like extend it to this line right here, we have the extend tool. I don't use the extend tool that much. I use, it's kind of used quite, it's used a little bit more in order for practicing purposes, but I, I don't think I've ever had to use the extend tool when I'm counting something to be put on the robot, but it's just there, it's really nice. So we have something called, so something that's very useful is convolute entities and offset entities. And we have some of these more complicated stuff, but I really won't go into that because I believe it's a little bit out of the scope. So these tools usually require you to have something already made. So I'm gonna do that super quick. Just create a super quick rectangular prism. Oh, it's already there, Never mind. So we have the sketch already made for us. I'm going to hide it super quick. You're not just limited to sketches on these three primary planes. You can also sketch on different planes. So if I'm interested in sketching on this top plane, I could right click and go sketch, normal to it. So the most common use for convert entities is when you wanna design stuff based on uh, off other parts. So I'm currently on this sketch and it's a brand new sketch. There's no lines on already. What if I'm interested in pulling something from a previous sketch? Something that's already been made. So what if I wanna include this specific line in my sketch? So what, what I would do is, like this, normal. What I would do is I click it, I can convert entities and it shows up right there, which makes it super nice. I could also do the same thing. I could click the face and go convert entities and it automatically gives me that, uh, gives me those lines through the face. So something that you might end up working on is that you might make something and notice that, you know, when it comes to manufacturing, it won't be precise. For example, when you, when you design your holes, we use the metric system. So we use M3, M4, M5 screws. And, our, and you know, ideally, our poles are exactly three millimeters in diameter, four millimeters in diameter, but we do have to account for some tolerance here. So examples like that, where you have to account for make it slightly bigger, is that we have the offset entities. And basically, we can choose how far it wants to be, two, and see how it kind of chooses right here. You could reverse it and go on the inside. It's a very quick way of clicking something and having to do it for us. Instead of having to do line, 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 what we can do instead is base it off of a certain uh, already made feature. So I'm going to delete that. Something we use a lot often is the mirror entities. And for example, what if I create a rectangle right here? In this example where I would use the center line because you need a line to mirror off of, you can use mirror entities. You could use click, 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 click. You mirror about this. See how I kind of show on the right side? This is to help a lot with symmetry, with symmetry. And I'll always keep on emphasizing that is that if your part can be symmetric, then that'd be super nice because not only does that make it better for manufacturing, unless you use 3D printing, but if you were to make it on the CNC mills, the normal, the manual mills, it's a lot nicer if it's symmetric because there's a lot less complication that comes up with it. So if you click co the copy, what it means is that if you have a copy selected, then the stuff that you're trying to mirror will stay there. But if you have it dis diselected, then this will disappear. It just basically move over, it move over across the line. Okay. Something else that's super nice is called the link, it's called piling sword. It basically, instead of drawing circle, 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 what you can do instead is draw one circle and do a linear sketch pattern. You can try to choose, oh, I want it to be uh, two millimeters apart. Oh, that's a bit too close. How about I do four? There you go. I can up, up, and it tells me right there, four. You can also do the same thing for a circular pattern. For example, if you want to kind of have this circle just evolve around, we could do say this. Circle sketch pattern. Basically, choose the center, center, choose entities to pattern like this. Same thing. Four, maybe you want five. Super easy. And all these circles are always the same size. You don't have to worry about anything. Maybe you want to up it up. Eight, super easy. Instead of drawing eight 
separate circles. You can draw one and use a pattern in this form. So in this in a scenario where you are not, so the only way this works, as you probably notice, is that it's a linear sketch pattern. So they're all connected with the dimensions the same, you know, like four, four millimeters apart. So what if you're not interested in having four millimeters apart? Then you basically have to draw them yourselves. Draw. I want this to be here. I want this to be super far, and I want this to be close again. Oh, too close. So the next thing is I'll show you something that I use a lot in drawings. It's called the ordinate dimension. So basically, you set a reference as your zero, and it dimensions 2.47, 6.59, 16.06, 16.07, 16.09. So I don't I I almost never use this for normal sketching purposes. And the reason for this is because you usually need to have a good idea of where your holes are. And you can usually steal that from a part you're already gonna make. Because most of the time you're not making a hole just to make a hole for fun. Unless you're using it for pockets uh pocketing purposes where you're trying to reduce rate, uh reduce weight. But a lot of the times you want to have it deal with fasteners, so you usually make the hole. And then you, bas you, you basically use convert entities or uh, offset entities and basically reference that hole. So usually this is used a lot more often when you already have, when you, when you have a decent idea of how you're gonna dimension your hole. And the reason for this is because you need a zero, as you can mention right here. This does not look unless you have like a specified zero. There's some other tools that you can also use move entities, copy. These are really only used when you want to basically uh, copy paste sketches, which is possible. You can copy a sketch from part A and paste it in part B. I've done that before. Uh, when you want to do stuff with the spline, you can basically move stuff, rotate stuff. There's some other stuff here that's kind of pretty that I really don't really worry about. Fully defined a sketch can be kind of nice if you already have a decent amount you notice that it says right here at the bottom, under define, and you notice that when you dimension stuff fully, uh, let's try to dimension this fully. Here, do this. Okay, what other dimensions do I need to make? Uh, I think this, this. So as you can see that if it's fully defined, it turns all black, but if not, it's blue. You can kind of tell really easily if you can move it, it's under defined. And basically, fully dimensioned sketch basically dimensions everything, so it's all black. And the reason why you do this is, you know, there's no there's no real purpose, honestly, to this. If you basically, if you have all the dimensions that you need already, you really don't need to fully define it because it's not going to move unless someone makes the move automatically. It's entirely up to you if you like having that fully defined. Okay, let me remove all of these dimensions. So those are all of the sketch tools that we mainly that we mainly use. So the next thing we'll go over is something called sketch relations. And it's part of the relationships uh, for sketches that you learn in the first workshop. So an example would be uh, like sometimes it says orientation here, horizontal, vertical, the very basic ones like horizontal. You see on my mouse that when I tilt it at an angle right next to the pencil where my mouse is, nothing shows up. But when you when I move it down to horizontal, that yellow box with the line in it is horizontal. And that basically means that this is a sketch relation. It's gonna be horizontal no matter what. So even if I try to move it, it remains horizontal no matter what I do. Because that is a sketch relation. Same thing with vertical, it shows up. But a lot of the times you have to add the sketch relation yourself. For example, I have these two vertical lines. One sketch relation, you can click and you can control click another another thing and I'll show right here all the sketch relations that are possible. So I can make it collinear, basically mean have the lines be on the same line like that. Let's make this at an angle. And how about I'm interested in making it perpendicular? Perpendicular. Have this also at an angle. I'm interested in having it be parallel. It can be parallel. The sketch relation I use the most often is something called equals because it basically forces these two things to be equal. You can do something called fix as well, basically that you can't move it. It basically kind of fully defines it. 
cannot drag the selected item is fixed. You can, the main difference is that you can move the points, which aren't fixed, but, you, but if you try to move the line, that would not be possible. See how, when I move the line in the center, you can move, but this one, I cannot move. I can move the points though. The points are not fixed. I can fix the points. As you see that once I fix it, this point is now black, but this point is still blue. So let me delete some of this stuff. I'll keep mine at the bottom. There's also stuff that you can do with circles. For example, if I were to create a circle right here, something called tangent basically means that, like the symbol shows, this the edge of the circle is always going to be always going to be kind of like on the line. If you would extend it infinitely, as you can kind of see, I can't pass. Oh, besides, I, I can move the line, of course, but. If I would have mean on the right side of it, it's always the edge is going to be touching it. Another pretty common one is called the coincident. It basically means that these two should be touching. If I had to click the point, click the point, click these two points. Coincident, basically, I make a corner. There's something called mood that is super similar and uh, mood point. It basically almost acts as the same thing. I don't think I've ever found a scenario where coincident and mood are basically not the same thing. And there's some other stuff that you can do that's just specific with circles. So if I were to create a circle right here, super duper large, get a circle right here. Something you might be interested in doing is making sure that this center of this circle is basically right here. What you can do is click the center and click the center and do coincident. That perfectly works. What you can also do is make sure that these are concentric, meaning that the centers are always going to be the same. Then that you can also do basically the same thing is as co-radial. If you have complete circles, it's the base. It's basically the same thing as saying equal, but you can make it co-radial, meaning that the radius is going to be on the same. Uh, the radius is going to be the same as each other. And if the full circles, then obviously they're just going to be the same circle. As you can see, like the other one basically disappeared. There's a lot more sketch relationships. You can kind of mess around with a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of freedom in how you choose your sketch relations. Like there's sometimes when you can have there's no sketch relations at all. You can define them yourself. Entirely up to you. So I'm going to exit out of this. I'm going to turn back to the normal rectangle sketch. I can roll back. That sketch never existed. So I'm going to delete it for now. Okay. That sketch. Okay. So dimensions. So what you can do is, as I mentioned in the first workshop, what if I'm interested in creating a 20 and a 40? Well, the dimensions. So, but then I noticed that hmm, I want to kind of double the size. So I have to change the 20 and the 40. And that can be kind of consuming. This really isn't that time consuming because we just have one sketch. But a lot of the times you have sketches that are based off of the sketches and you want to keep these fairly consistent. So what you can do is use something called the equation tool. So if you do not have equations on the left side, you can type it up here. Go to two equations. So let's create an equation. So I can name it side length. And how about I go to the value? So I'm interested in, let's just say 20 millimeters. Nice. Okay, I can create a comment. Uh, the length of square side. Okay, looks like it's eight. So I can go back into my sketch. So the main main obvious surface between a normal dimension and uh, a parameter, which is an, an, an a dimension that uses an equation, is you need you need to use equals. So for example, if I were to type in side length twenty, which is like this, I have the twenty, but then what if I were to change it? Go to equations. I don't want twenty anymore. How about thirty? Enter. And let's save super quick. Okay, make sure you save often. So you see how the 20 is still there because all because then we're just using the value from the equation. This is right here. 
start with the equal sign to create an equation. So equals side length 30. And you can see, based off right here, is that the, this dimension has the, uh, the summation symbol. That means that this is a parameter. It uses an equation. So if we want to change it, we can easily change it. So how about we make that two times length that we've been talking about. We can do is equal. We can use a global variable, or we can click it, click times two. So now this will always be double. So let's look at this. So we have this sort of rectangular shape right here. Equation, how about we make it 20? It changes, let's see the actual change. And based on this equation, 20, 40, okay, consistent. How about we make it 40 millimeters? Same thing, it looks like it automatically updated. 40, 80. Equations are super nice. And, and the reason why a lot of the times you, there's some reasons why you'd want to use equations early on, but a lot of the times you just use dimensions because you're not sure what your equations want to be. So let's open a part that I've already been working on, just show you a nice example. Something called chassis base plate. So I already use equations right here. So I have, so I'll quickly go over exactly what this looks like. Odd is, is one set to rectangle that I used and I basically forced it and made the sides equal using the equal relations to force it into a square. I'm using equation 350 millimeters, as you can probably see here. I'm interested in using this for the base plate of our chassis. So with this, if I were to make some changes to it, it, can, it would easily update. Because I'm not really sure how big I want to make it. So as you probably see from here, when I change this to 400, it can change. There it is right here. And the thickness, I have also the thickness as its own variable because I'm interested in using like a thickness that I already know. Based off the comment, we have 1 18th inch. So this is basically one example of an aluminum thickness sheet that we'd use. 1 8 is kind of like, it's basically double the size that you would use for bending sheet metal. And this is the size that I'm kind of interested in using for our chassis base plate, which is why I have it here. This nice comment is to help remind me that this is in millimeters, 3.175, but then this also is 1 8 of an inch. I'm going to see that here. I'm going to exit this file, go back to this part. Okay. And the next thing that I also need to show that's necessary for the assessment is the extrude. So I'm going to delete that. As you've probably seen me use it a little bit before, I can extrude it. I'll go over the, I'll go over the different types of you know from direction. But all you really need to know right now is the blind extrude. You can kind of extrude it a little bit wherever you want it to be. And we need to use something called the measure tool, which you can go into evaluate. You can go into measure. Basically, we use this a lot to figure out the distance between things and also, and also to measure stuff. But for this purpose, you basically have to find the area of a sketch and you can do that super easily with clicking on the face. There it is. Or you, there it is. 320 millimeters squared. And then that's what you need for assessment. So if I were to create a hole super quick, this even works if you do have a hole inside of your part. So if I were to cut it, or isometric here again. If we were to measure the area on top, where is that? The area is no longer 3,200 millimeters squared. It is now less than that. And that's kind of obvious. We have a gigantic hole in the middle. That makes a lot of sense. And that's what you need to complete the first assessment. So let me start screen sharing for now. I'll quickly go over that and then we can go over questions if there is any. Share my screen, go over to oh, sketching, training program. So right here is the second assessment. So enter your name, email, that's some basic questions, whether or not a sketch relation. So the first thing is called the small armor module plate. 
So you're given a drawing and if when you're trying to practice for certification, you'll see drawings a lot or you're trying to manufacture stuff. You will make a drawing and we'll have a drawing workshop, which is our very last one. So there's some stuff that you should probably notice is that, you know, this part is symmetric about the center line. That means that instead of creating one gigantic part, you can create one half of the part and mirror it to the other side, entirely up to you. We see some dimensions right here. The 4X stands for four of these. As you probably see, 4X means, in this case, it means four holes. This symbol right here will fully see diameter. The reason why we, I have a question mark is because I'm making uh, the people that plan to do these quiz and have it do, you have to look at the rules. And the reason for that is because you have to be familiar with the rules. And that's basically how you design suits and stuff. The, on the left side, the R stands for radius. This looks like a fillet of radius 10. The other dimensions, the square is 50 long. This bottom corner is 18 millimeters away from right here. And if you're interested in doing this assessment, then it's right here. If you have any questions for support, it is the mechanical support channel in the Discord. If you are an incoming member, if not, then feel free to either privately DM me or use the questions channel. That is, that is one of our public ones to ask any questions if you're interested. And that is the end of this content. If there are any questions, then you can ask any questions. Um, yeah. Is it possible to bring my like, sketches from other files or projects? Uh, by, so when you mean files, do you mean other parts? Yes. So that is possible. And I'll go through that during our assembly workshop, which is not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. But I can kind of quickly show how you, you do that. So let me do something called make an assembly. So I can go assembly. Put the part. So something that you can do is I can insert a component. So let me insert something with holes. So you oftentimes have to reference parts because some of them are very, very specific. So right here, I have some of our very specific stuff. So let's see. I'm a module assembly right here. Well, that's super duper big. So we have this, well, that is super duper small. Okay, anyway, but okay, let me make this flow instead. So the reason, so you, oftentimes you have to basically reference and stuff because in order to mount this piece of electronic, you have to mount it with these holes and I can't change these holes. Like it's just always there. It's a standardized component. We basically buy this component and it's always gonna be like that. So the thing we have to change is basically this piece. So what I do would be, I can basically have this connected under and I'll show you all this basic, I'll show all this stuff when we get to that workshop is what you can do is basically I can edit this part and so use something called top down assembly. The top assembly is not gonna see. Let me see this part. Say, I don't wanna see it there. Let's try to edit this part. Okay, so I'm in this part and you can reference stuff from other parts. So I could create a sketch on the top plate and this is where I just convert entities. I can click here, I can click right here. Convert entities, see how it places two, those two holes right there. And then I could use something called extruded cut, which I, will teach, which I will be teaching in the next workshop. I can cut all the way down, all the way down. And notice how now when I exit the part, it has these holes. So by referencing a part, I'm able to make sure that I have these holes in exact location. And this is pretending that this plate is not gonna change at all. It's always gonna be like right here. And that's an example of how you would use a different part or, or like just in your wood, a different file in order to make changes to like add, to basically reference off in a sketch. And when you go back to this piece, the holes are still going to remain. This is something called a, a question mark, which means it's an external reference. I will also cover that in the assembly workshop, which is basically the workshop that's after the next one.
and then hit with that kit on your test. Oh, so is this still in like a assembly file then after you remove the part? Uh, what do you mean by remove the part? Um, the other part that you imported, like after you remove it, can you still like modify and make sketches there? So, okay, let me go back to this assembly. Okay, so I don't want, I'm trying my best to get it too complicated. So if I were to move this part right here, can I still modify it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like make it make sketches on it and stuff. Yeah. No, I if I if I delete it, it's like no longer there at all. Like I there's nothing for there's absolutely nothing for me to reference on. And the most important thing is that if you delete a part that you kind of base something on, you notice that there's this warning. The reason for this is because it's an external reference. It kind of needs that part to be to know exactly where the holes are. Oh. So, so like you need parts, you know, to reference stuff off of. And in assembly wise, you also need the part if you're gonna reference it. Otherwise, the otherwise SOLIDWORKS has no idea. And the most important thing is that we use convert entities. And basically we the convert entities tool allows you to reference other tools. If you there's another way to do this, and if you want to bypass convert entities, basically you have these sketches, you can make it basically um what is it? Instead of having it be normal sketches, you can make it construction and you can make your own. So instead of using Cooper NCDs, you basically make your own squares. Um, own circles, not squares. And that's one way to bypass it. And it's only up to you on which way you want to do, but that's an example of what you can do instead. You see how it no longer has that question mark anymore? It's because I use I the the circle I use Cooper NCDs on is no longer kind of like being forced to create these holes. I basically made my own circles. So and now it's kind of like its own separate thing. Oh, okay. So no more question marks. It still remains the arrow because I did reference something that's not from this part. But yeah. Let's see. And then hopefully if I delete this, there should be no errors. So there is a Reaper error, but we do not have any red errors, which is fantastic. So Yeah, so there's some errors that still go along because we still do reference it because the circles do are getting referenced from the other circles, but there's slightly less errors. And you could probably basically fix that. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. That's not assembly. Oh, I cannot undo the very sad part of if you exit, if you exit, if you go to a separate part, then you can no longer do the undo key. Very unfortunate. Let's close this. Do not save and we care. So yes. And tomorrow we'll go over parts and exactly how we deal with the different errors. Oh, okay. All right. That is the end of this workshop. Uh, it went a lot, it's slightly a bit longer than I would like it to be, but I usually aim for, I'd say, max one hour long. But thank you for coming. Okay, thank you.